going to go into telephone when I pray. Oh, okay. Yeah, we want to cross here to uh, build the church. Okay. So so we're we're in. Basically, we're put on pause. We're going to put it on pause. Put it on pause. Put it on pause. Amen. Not forever, but it's on pause for right now. Amen. Amen. And we've been needing to work on building and getting this church we you know, we got the building, we got it ran down, we gotta build it up. We got that's up to us to work. Because they ain't no way who's gonna fly in here with a bus, you know, a metro bus and drop them off in the front door for it. We had to go get them. Because the word of God says what? It says go forth. Amen. I don't know how you're gonna turn the bus around that corner, but anyway. <laughs> All right. Let's look for you. All right. So we're, we're glad tonight for this lesson, Father God. Christ the first fruits, amen. We're in lesson 44, God, and we've only got what? Seven more to go? Yeah. No. Seven, eight more to go. We have 52 lessons, and we're on 44. So we're getting there, amen. We are crossing that plateau, amen. We started off with one right around this time last year. I think it was in August we started, and we've been going steady, amen. So let's go ahead and look into our lesson tonight. Now, if you notice some writing on the side is for some reason, this copter might get a lot of copy the whole page, even though I set it in the right, set it in the right spot where it's supposed to do, following all the instructions, and it did not want to. So I had to go over there and look at the other outline that I grew up from and write down the words. So it's just, just the Antichrist, amen? amen. That's all it is. Sure, you know, good devil. We push the right buttons, and the machine doesn't want to work. You know, yeah. So, amen. All right. In the last chapter, we examined some of the main passages of the Old Testament that foretold the resurrection. We saw that the Old Testament foretold the following three main events that Christ himself would be raised from the dead, that those who believe in Christ will share his resurrection, and number three, there will be also a resurrection for the wicked for the purpose of judgment and punishment. Now, if we turn to the New Testament, we'll find in the revelation it gives concerning the resurrection of the dead it, 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 it agrees exactly with the three main points and with that of the Old Testament. However, a good deal more for information is also given to make the whole picture clearer and more uh, clear and better. Amen. The three successive phrases of the resurrection. The first New Testament passage we will consider is found in John. Jesus says in John 5.45, or 5.25, 5.25, okay. Man, most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will live. See that? He's telling them that people in the grave, mm -hmm. you know, they think that they're, uh, once you're dead, you're gone, you're, you know, you're annihilation, you ain't around, you're history, you know, you never be brought, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. They're in for a big surprise because you'll be laying there in your grave and you're going to hear what? His voice. Mm -hmm. Rise, right. Leroy. Yes, what? <laughs> right? It's going to happen. Amen. Yes. Yeah. That's it. Whoever your name is, Leroy, Eugene, Harold, <laughs> Maud, <laughs> amen. 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 All right. Elvira, whatever. Uh, Everybody. Is going here. Yes. That he told it. Now that must have blew some people's mind. What? Well, you the you, you, you know that's what they're doing. They're, they, 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 they. Because he told them that he is going to call them forth from their graves, yes, and they're going to hear my voice, and they are asleep in the grave. They're going to hear my voice. Amen. Amen. And again, he says the same thing in the same chapter, chapter five, verse twenty-eight and twenty-nine. He says, "Do not marvel at this." For the hour is coming to which all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done, done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I think the old King James says damnation. Uh -huh. Amen. And so he ain't, he ain't beating around the bush. Yeah. Amen. He's telling them the way it is. Yes. Everybody's going to hear my word. Amen. They're going to hear my voice. They think that Buddha's going to raise them up. They think they're going to be surprised. And they think, oh, Muhammad. Oh, yeah, yeah Muhammad. Yeah, he's the one. No, he ain't the one. Oh, what about uh, Confucius? Amen. You know, as I call him, not Confucius, but Confuse us. Amen. Confuse us. Amen. He ain't, he, they ain't going to rise up and see him either. They ain't going to rise up and see the Dalai Lama. They're not going to rise up and see one of the 
one of the prophets, uh, John the Baptist, or somebody from the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter Day Saints. Yeah. They're not going to see that, Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. But they're going to hear that Jesus said, "I'm the one, and I'm calling you forth, and you're coming forth to go to judgment." Yes, yes. Now there are two phrases in verse 25. He said, "The dead," and then in verse 28 he says, "And all those who are in the grave." So it seems like the context seems to indicate that the two phrases are almost not identical, but contrasted with each other. So, in the first phrase, the dead must be taken to describe not only those who are physically dead, but rather those who are spiritually dead in sin. This is in line with the language that Paul uses in Ephesians 2, chapter 1. You, he has made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin. How many know you were dead in Christ? Amen? Amen. How many know that you're dead in Christ before you Amen. 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 You tried to feel you were dead until you tried being good, you know. You, you uh, tried doing this, you worked here, you worked there, you worked on this little thing. Uh, even when I was younger, I uh, was there for a while, uh, and I was about, what, 19 years old. I started going to church on Sundays and, you know, put on a white shirt and a tie and walking in there and, you know, playing the part of being a Christian. And, and then uh, I went back at home and Here's a family fight. <laughs> and they were going at it. And I got mad at them. And I just swore up and down. And, and they were all looking at me. We thought you were going to church. And, uh, <laughs> well, I realized that I went, you know, I'm spiritually dead, you know. Because I've been going fine to the fight program. And then I got into it. And, so forget it. All yes. right. Amen. So, amen. Just to show you that I was dead in sin. Yes. Amen. amen. I needed to say that. The context here makes it plain that Paul was not speaking about people who are physically dead, but he's speaking about people who, as a result of their sin, are spiritually dead and what? Alienated from God. Yeah. Yeah. Right? What does alienated mean? You were separated. Yeah. Yeah. There was a big, you remember the story of the rich man of Lazarus? What happened? Mm -hmm. There, he said, send Lazarus over here. Mm -hmm. Put the finger, fingers in the water and touch my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. Yes. Yeah. And it, what did Abraham said? He can't do it because of the great gulf between, yes. between us. Yes. And it's fixed. So one cannot come from one side to the other. So that is just to show you that. Once you're separated from God and you ain't been born again yet, there is that big gap there. Amen. Yeah. He says, well, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is so for eternal life through yeah. Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You see, Paul uses language borrowed from Isaiah to exhort the sinner. He says, awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you life, Ephesians 5, 14. Mm -hmm. You see that? Amen. God is saying to what? Wake up. Amen? Yes, yes. By the way, they used to be in my dad's, one of my dad's favorite sayings. He'd get mad at me and my brothers, and he'd say, why don't you guys wake up and die right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's it. So, you know, our, our moms and dads had some great sayings. Amen. But see, Paul exhorts these people to awake and rise from the dead is not a physically dead, but spiritually dead in sin. We would seem, therefore, that we should apply this interpretation to the words of Jesus. John 5, 25, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear it will live. You're saying that they who hear it will live? Well, wait a minute. Did he say all will hear his voice? But if we look at the, the story of when uh, St. Paul was knocked off the horse on the road to Damascus, said, yeah. there was one account where it says that the people heard a voice speaking. Mm -hmm. And then another account, he says, well, they heard the voice of one speaking, but they did not understand his words mm -hmm. because he was speaking to Paul. But yet they heard him. So I was looking at kind of amazed by that because they said, yeah, Everybody's going to hear his words, but the ones that hear his words, it says, rise up and live. Amen. And welcome thou into the joy of the Lord. Those are the ones that are saved, amen. But the ones that ain't saved are going to hear something else. It's time for you to depart into the lake of fire, amen, which is prepared for the devil and his angels. Hallelujah. Jesus is here speaking with the response of those in death and sin to the voice of Christ. Brought them to the preaching and the gospel. Those who hear will live. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you heard tonight? Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I heard the word of the Lord. 
Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. The Amen. word of the Lord came to me saying, Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. That is, those who receive the gospel message with faith will verify or receive forgiveness and eternal life. This is confirmed by the fact that Jesus said, The hour is coming, and now is. That is to say, the preaching of the gospel to men dead in sins has already commenced at the time when Jesus spoke these words. Amen? Oh, yeah. Remember, he sent them out two by two, heal yeah. the sick, raise the dead, and preach what? The gospel. Yes, Amen. So they were going forth to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Yes, yeah. Hallelujah. So that was happening even at the time when he spoke it. That was already getting folks saved. Amen. And we notice the contrast between this and the words of Jesus in John 5, 28 and 29. The hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. Those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Now let's look at the three main points here. First, Jesus said the hour is coming. He does not add, and now is. That is to say, the events of which Jesus here is speaking is entirely in the future, but they have not yet been fulfilled. Second, Jesus uses the phrase, all those are in the grave. This clearly refers to those who actually died and have been buried. He says that the, all these, without exception, will hear. Whereas in the previous passage, concerning the dead, he indicated that only some would hear, but not all. Third, in the second passage, Jesus actually uses the word resurrection. He says, all those in the grave will come forth to resurrection. Aren't you glad one day you're going to hear that trumpet sound? Yes, Lord. Oh, Lord. Yes, Lord. Amen. And you're going to rise up. Amen. And you're going to go for a flight. Yes. Amen. And you know what he says, in the moment of twinkling of night, we shall all be what? Caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Yes. Faster than a rocket. We've all seen the rocket ships take off, and we watch and watch and go and go and go and go. Mm -hmm. But the rapture is... <laughs> They're gone. Oh, yeah. Amen. Just like that. In that moment. Yes. Some guy said, if I see the rapture, I'm around and I see the rapture going to happen. And, and the guy starts to go up in the air and says, I'm going to jump on him. Hang on. <laughs> it won't happen that way because he yeah. says in the moment. Yeah. In the twinkling of an eye. Amen. Amen. You've seen the twinkling of an eye. Amen. Yes, That's it. Quick. I hit it. That's it. Quick. And you rip it out. Okay. I'm talking to you. But I don't blame that Jesus stuff. Hey, where'd you go? Uh -huh. Why don't we just hear talking to somebody? Yeah. Right? It's that. It's going to happen. It's called the blessed hope. Amen. Oh, Hallelujah. We're going to we're going to rise up and meet him in the air. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Third, in the second passage, he actually uses the word resurrection. That means he's going to raise us up. So we conclude, therefore, that in the first passage, Jesus is speaking about the response to those that are physically dead, spiritually dead in sin. Well, the second passage, he's speaking about the little resurrection of those that have actually been died and been buried. In the second passage, Jesus speaks about the two dis distinct aspects of the resurrection. One, the resurrection of life. Two, the resurrection of condemnation. So the King James, amen, damnation. That's, mm -hmm. it. That's pretty sad. Amen. Now, this agrees with the revelation from Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 3. In each case, the resurrection is spoken of in two distinct phases, that of the righteous and that of the wicked. In each case, the resurrection of the righteous precedes that of the wicked. If, remember, he said that the, those will rise and will rise up to everlasting life, and he said, Daniel says, those are, other ones will rise up to everlasting condemnation. So Daniel talked about the resurrection, of the righteous and the wicked, and so be Jesus confirming it, because Jesus is what? Yes. Jesus is the one, the, the author of the Word of God, so yes. he's the one that spoke it for it. So there we have a togetherness there, a uh, one uh, backing out the other. In addition, we learn from the words of Jesus, one further point not revealed to Daniel, in Daniel. The voice that will call all the dead forth to resurrection will be that of Christ himself, the Son of God. How many remember that? When he stood at the graveside, he said, roll away the stone. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. Yeah. Now, I've, I heard one Bible teacher say, if he only stood there and say, come forth, is it the whole graveyard really got out of it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They all came because that's the what? That's God's son right there. Amen. Amen. 
He's already raised up, what, a couple of other people, Jairus' daughter, the little 12-year-old boy in the funeral, right? He's already raised them up. He's already spoke to devils, no devils come out and get out and stay out, amen? Yes. He's healed the sick. He's healed and cleansed the lepers, amen? Yes. He restored sight to the blind, yes. hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Yes. You can imagine that when he says, come forth, amen? When it's your time, he's going to call you forth, amen? You will. Hallelujah. Oh, we want to hear his voice, amen? Hallelujah. We don't want to hear nobody else. Amen. Yes, that's right. We want to see him. Hallelujah. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, uh, For in Adam all die. Even so, in Christ all shall be made alive, but in each one in his own order. Christ, the first fruits afterwards, those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he, Christ, delivers the kingdom of God to the Father, and he puts it into all rule all authority and all power, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 through 24. Notice the phrase says, each one will come in his own order. The word translated order is used to describe a rank of soldiers. Here Paul pictures a resurrection as occurring in three successive phrases, like three ranks of soldiers marching past one behind the other. The first consists of Christ himself. Christ the first fruits. Of course, Christ is the first fruits from the dead, right? He's the first one to rise up from the dead. Yes, Amen? Because uh -huh. when he rised up from the dead, he never died again. Amen. Others might have gotten resurrected, but they died again. Yeah. But Christ never has to die again. and will never die again. Amen? Right. So he is the first fruits. Hallelujah. The second phase consists of all believers when Christ returns. Those who are Christ at his coming. Amen? We belong to Jesus. Amen. Well, we're going up. Hallelujah. And that resurrection. Remember the old song, I'm going up? Yes. I'm going up. I'm going up in the first resurrection. I'm going up to be with the Lord. Amen. 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 And they say it's coming from the north. They'll be coming from the south. They'll be coming from the east. And they'll be coming from the west. I'm going up. I'm going up. I'm going up to be the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The third phase is called the end. That is the end of Christ's earthly reign for a thousand years and at the close of which he will deliver up the kingdom to God the Father. And then of the resurrected of this day, the majority, but not all, will belong to the resurrection of the wicked as foretold in Daniel and in Corinthians. However, we shall see this new course of further details explained concerning Revelation 20. For in the meantime, let us examine more closely what Paul says about the first two phrases. Okay, typology. How many understand what typology is? It is a, a picture giving you a illustration of a particular thing. All right. Uh, you could say, uh, what's a good way to describe typology? We're talking about a screwdriver. So right away, what a person gets a picture in their mind of a screwdriver. Then you have to say. Is it a standard or is it a Phillips? Uh -huh. And then you have what? Another picture of the screwdriver, whether it's a Phillips, you know what size it is. Yeah. And if you need a, a two pointer, a three pointer, or a four pointer screwdriver, then you get another type of picture in your mind of what it is. Uh -huh. All right, so that's, that's a, given a quick, easy description. Okay. The first phrase, Chris, Paul says, Christ the first fruits. By this phrase, Paul compares the resurrection of Christ to the ceremony of presenting the first fruit of the harvest up to the Lord as ordained by the children of Israel under the law of Moses. In Leviticus 23, verse 10 and 11. Here it says, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land I give you, reap its harvest, you shall bring a sheep of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest, and he shall wave the sheep before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf, uh, on the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Now, how many know what the sheep is? I'll show you. This, this is a sheep of wheat. You know, it's a bunch of wheat gathered, and then it's tied here, all right? We have it in this pot for display purposes. Now, some are huge, 
And when they bring the sheaves, it's the first ones of the harvest, they're to bring them, and then the priests receive them and wave them before the Lord, and then it goes into the temple, amen? Yeah. So the temple can have supply, so they can make the bread. Yeah. So we know they had a, a table and a, and a temple in the holy, most holy place, and that was where the 12 loaves of bread were, and they were baked out there, were displayed for the 12 tribes of Israel. The sheep of the first fruit, weighed before the Lord, is a picture of Christ coming forth from the dead as the sinner's representative and the beginning of a new creation. Notice how accurate the picture is. The sheep of the first fruits was the first complete fruit to line up out of the seed that had been buried earlier in the earth. Moses told the children of Israel, and the priest was to wave this sheep offering before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. Amen. He waved before the Lord. And it was acceptable. Yeah. The sheep was what? The seed that was buried in the ground. Yeah. Christ was buried in the ground. The, the, the wheat was harvest. Christ arose from the dead, becoming the first fruits and the first harvest of the Lord. Yeah. So we see the picture there, how, how they bring the sheep and, 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 and wave them. There's, there's an old time gospel song. It says, we bring in the sheep. Bringing in the sheep, we shall come rejoicing. Bringing in the sheep because we take it to the to the priest that he waves it before the Lord, and oh hallelujah, it is accepted. Amen. And when Christ rose again from the dead, his sacrifice and his coming alive was accepted by God for our behalf. Amen. So that's just a beautiful picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. He said the sheep of the first fruits will wave before the Lord. It is a picture of Christ coming forth from the dead and as a sinner's representative and the beginning of a new creation. Romans 4.25 tells us that Christ was delivered up for our offenses and raised because of our justification. Amen. How many know that what justification means? It means being made right with God. Yes. Hallelujah. He was raised so I could be made right. Amen. A dirty old sinner like me. Amen. Dirtbag sinner, amen. The one on his way to hell, amen. amen. One that was doing everything he can to get there, amen. and yet didn't know, but God had provided a sacrifice, amen. amen. And when I heard the word of the Lord, I believed and I received, and I became born again. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord. The resurrection of Christ not only vindicated his own righteousness, but it made it possible for the believer to be reckoned equally righteous with Christ before God. Hallelujah. Because of the work that he did. Amen. We're made right with God. Hallelujah. Amen. Furthermore, the sheaves of the first root were to be waved to the Lord on the day after the Sabbath. Since the Sabbath was the seventh, or the last day of the week, the day after the Sabbath was the first day of the week. The day on which Christ, in fact, did rise from the dead. Did you notice that? The priest was to wave it before the Lord the day after the Sabbath. And the day after the Sabbath is what? Sunday, the first day of the week, the day that Christ rose from the dead. He said early in the morning after the Passover, the women went to the tomb wanting to get the stone rolled back so they could finish the uh, cleaning the body and, and anointing him with oils and getting him ready for his final burial. But, hallelujah, when they got to the tomb, they found the stone been rolled away. They, 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 they were curious and they went in there to look and and they saw a man dressed in white and said, what are you looking for the dead here? He said, the one you're looking for, he's not here. He's no longer dead, but he's alive. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father God. Finally, the wave in the first fruits was an act of worship. Amen. Wave your hands before the Lord. Mm -hmm. There have been services where they just swaying back and forth, was waving their hands before the Lord as the offering. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And the triumph. Amen. For the appearing of the first fruits of the appointed season gave assurance that the rest of the harvest would be gathered in safely. And in likewise manner, the resurrection of Christ gives us the assurance that all the remaining dead will also in their due season be resurrected. Hallelujah. Did you know resurrection time? He ain't going to forget nobody. Now look, what happened to little Georgie? Little, little Georgie, where's little Georgie? Oh, I forgot, he's over there. Come to work, Georgie. No, he ain't gonna forget nobody. Hallelujah. 
That means he ain't going to forget you. He ain't going to forget me. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Now, however, there's just one further prophetic revelation concerning Christ's resurrection contained in the Old Testament ordinance of the first fruits. Jesus spoke prophetically of his own impending death and burial, and he compared this to a grain of wheat being buried in the earth. He said, Most assuredly, I say unto you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. John chapter 12, verse 24. By this, Jesus taught the fruit of the ministry of reconciliation between God and man could only come as a result of his own atoning death and resurrection. Hallelujah. If he were to stop short of death on the cross, no fruit could come forth out of his ministry. Only through his death, burial, and resurrection could there come forth fruit of a great harvest of sinners justified and reconciled to God. He presented this to his disciples as a picture of a grain of wheat being buried in the earth, germinating and springing up again as the fruitful stock out of the earth. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He did it all. Amen. Yes, Hallelujah. Lord. He did it. Hallelujah. Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful God. What a marvelous yes, Savior. Hallelujah. Yes, he did it. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise you, God. Praise you, Father God. Yes, Hallelujah. 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 I'm feeling the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yes, Hallelujah. Yes, I am feeling the presence of God. Yes, Amen. Hallelujah. Yes, Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In nature, throughout a single grain of wheat is buried in the earth, the stalk that springs up to it, never it never bears merely one single grain, but a whole cluster of grains upon one stalk. As Jesus indicated the parable the parable of the sower, the ratio of increase out of a single grain may be thirty fold, sixty fold, or a hundred fold. How many know when you plant one little uh, corn seed of corn, it grows up and you have uh, several stalks of corn, uh -huh. right? And on that is several ears of corn. Yeah. And then if you look at the corn, you got a big old ear. It's probably got what? Maybe a thousand little kernels on it. You got all from one came many. Amen. So all through Christ's resurrection. Amen. His death, his burial, his resurrection. Uh, yeah. Through one's death. Amen. Uh, yeah. Many came, amen. Many yes. seeds, amen. Many corns, many stalks, amen. Much wheat, amen. Much wheat with all the things, amen. They take this and they take it and put that on the threshing floor and they beat it and beat it and beat it and get all the seeds up and gather the seeds. And then therefore they go ahead and do the process of making dough so they could bake bread. Right? Yes. All because of one, amen. One, one sacrifice, one death, amen. One resurrection, hallelujah. And then he has many seeds, amen. Many stocks of corn, many years of corn. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. That's why he said 30 fold, 60 fold, or 100 fold. This truth of natural law applies also to the spiritual counterpart of Christ's resurrection. Christ was buried alone, but he did not rise alone. In fact, in which he had surprisingly made little mention of the authority of the Bible by Bible commentators. It is clearly stated in Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 through 53. These verses record the death of Jesus on the cross and the various events that followed to his death and resurrection. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up the spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two. Amen. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of their grave, uh, after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. These events described here are presented in close succession one to another. It is clearly the total period of time that they covered over the three days. The death of Jesus uh, the cross took place on the eve of the Sabbath, but his resurrection took place on the morning of the first day of the new week. In connection with this, Matthew states, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which had fallen asleep were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, and they appeared to many. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. What precise moment the graves were opened, we do not know. 
Well, we do know that it was only after the resurrection of Christ himself, these resurrected saints rose and came out of the graves. Remember, he died on the cross. He said, it is finished. The veil in the temple was ripped. You know that veil was five foot thick? Think about it. We're not talking five foot tall. We're talking five foot thick. It was like, you know, when you show you, it's like impassability. It was, it was, you could not pass through it. The only way the priest could get through it, what we believe is, they had ropes tied to it at a certain time. And on the outside, they said, okay, open. And they would open it and allow the priest to walk in. And to sprinkle the blood upon the, the, the mercy seat. But he said that happened. And then he said the, the righteous that were in the graves rose up and went into the city and appeared to many. Can you imagine that? Yeah, yes, oh. yeah. wow. hey, this looks like Rimmel. Right? Uh -huh. It was. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> right? Uh -huh. That's it. And so we know that'll happen. So that'll be neat when because I we always believe when we get to heaven, we'll see a widescreen TV, you know, probably bigger than this wall. And we'll get to watch events. Lord, show us a your, show us the story of the resurrection again. You know? uh -huh. It'll probably be a daily feature. Let's see it again. Amen. Amen. How many want to see it again? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to see it again, Lord. Amen. 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 Show us how he closed the, the boat on Noah's Ark, Lord. Oh, uh -huh. right? That's it. Yeah. He said God shut the door, right? That's it. And when he shut the door, it didn't leak. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. In this way, the Old Testament type of the first fruit was perfectly fulfilled by the resurrection of Christ. Christ is buried alone. A single grain of wheat fell into the ground. But when he rose again from the dead, he was no longer alone, no longer in one single grain. But instead, there was a handful, a sheep of the first fruits, who uh, brought forth together with him out of the dead and waved in triumph before God as a token of the defeat of death, hell, and Satan. And as an assurance, all the believers who had been buried would also, in their due season, be resurrected. Amen. I know you know you decided to say, well, how come there's no other accounts of it? I think, well, because Satan didn't want the accounts to get out. But God put the account in His Word, and His Word is what true and forever, yeah. and it does not pass away. You have an earth will pass away, but not by words. So the Lord know, says, yes, Lord. "Give us that testimony. We know that to be true." All right. Concerning these Old Testament saints resurrected together with Jesus, two interesting questions naturally suggest themselves. The first one is, did these resurrection saints comprise of all the righteous believers of the Old Testament, and were all the Old Testament saints resurrected together with Jesus? To answer this question, it would appear to be no. For Matthew says, many bodies of the saints were raised. This phrase, many of the saints, is the normal usage would you indicate not all saints arose. This conclusion is reported by Peter on the day of Pentecost. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, Acts 2.29. Peter is here speaking 50 days after the resurrection of Christ, yet his words suggest that the body of David was still in his tomb at the time. This would have indicated that David, one of the greatest of the Old Testament saints, had not been resurrected at the time when Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost. Therefore, this resurrection of the Old Testament saints on the first Easter Sunday morning was a resurrection of some, but not of all. And it's true, because of the righteous kings that arose up, they probably would have been telling him, I'm David. Well, I'm Hezekiah. Uh, I'm Josiah. Yeah. Well, I'm Samuel the prophet. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? No, I think where it was is the ones that God had, you know, God chose to raise some up at that time, and that's what he did. Amen. Thank you. The second interesting question concerning these Old Testament saints is, what became the life of them, or what happened to them after the resurrection? Okay. From the account given, it would appear that the Old Testament saints were, in a true sense, resurrected. That is, they were raised up once and for all for the, out of the dominion of death and the grave never to return under that dominion. In this respect, there is complete difference between these saints and the people whom Jesus raised from the dead during his earthly ministry. Those whom Christ raised from the dead were called back from the dead out of the natural kind, the earthly life they were previously in. They still remained subject to the weakness of the mortal flesh, and in due course, they died again and were buried. These people had merely been restored to natural earthly life, but they have not been resurrected from the dead. On the other hand, the saints who rose with Jesus shared his resurrection with him, 
They enter into a new, new kind of life. They receive new spiritual bodies just like Christ himself had received. Matthew 27, 53 again. Coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they, the resurrected saints, went into the holy city, that is Jerusalem, and appeared to man. These words indicate that the saints had the bodies of the same kind that Jesus had after his resurrection. They could not appear or disappear at will. They were no longer subject to the physical limitations of a normal earthly body. If this is so, then there can be no thought that they ever returned again to their graves and submitted themselves afresh to the process of decomposition. In putting these resurrected bodies, they pass once and for all out of the shadow and the dominion of death and, gra and the grave and never return there again. Oh, just by the faith, and the Lord took those ones that raised up and took them into heaven. The word of God doesn't say so, but we'll just have to uh, go with that with the blood of the mysteries of the Bible. Amen. And we'll just have to take of that. But we won't argue with We know that they went home. What became of these saints after this? The New Testament does not give any definite or final answer to the question. However, it seems natural to suppose that the saints, having shared with Jesus in his resurrection, shared with him also in his ascension into heaven. Let us therefore glance briefly at the description of the ascension of Jesus into heaven. Acts 1, 9. And now when he spoke of these things, while he watched, he was taken up in a cloud, and the cloud received him out of their sight. We notice Jesus passed out of the, the, his disciples' sight into a cloud, and with this cloud he continued his ascent into heaven. Immediately after this, two angels appeared to the disciples and gave them the following assurance of the return of Christ. He said, This same Jesus, who was taken from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you've seen him go. Amen. Acts 1 11. Amen. Everything. Now, what you picture this, they're all talking to him, right? And then all of a sudden, he starts raising up. You can see their heads, their discipleship. Their mouths are going like, uh, right? And they're seeing him rise up, and he's going up. I can imagine what the, they're probably stall stuttering, but they saw him disappearing with the cloud. And then two angels said, "What you looking at?" Like ye men of Galilee, the King James says, "While you stand here gazing into the sky." This same Jesus, and the way you've seen him go is the way you'll see him return. Hallelujah. You know, back in the 70s, when I first got saved, there was this guy. He was claiming to be somebody special. He said that he was the Son of God. He was the Maharashi Guru Jai, I think it was. And he traveled around the world on a 747. And said he was the son of God. And they said, the son of God I know went up into the heavens yes. with no help of a helicopter yeah. or a jet pack yeah. or riding on the back of a rocket, amen, amen. or on a jet airliner or an old propeller airplane, yeah. amen. And he just rose up and went into heaven. And when he comes back, he's going to be the same one. Yeah. Anyway, this guy that was supposed to the son of God, he ended up having falling out and ended up uh, being coming uh, somewhat known as he ain't nothing anymore. He ain't who he said he was. Because like you tell me he's a son of God, and yet he's going to fly around an airplane. He got to go catch the metro. Oh, yeah. He got to go ride the 232 if he wants to get to the airport. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Amen. All right. So we know that. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. This indicates that there is a close parallel between the ascent of Christ into heaven and his return from heaven to earth. And he will come and likewise matter if we've seen him go. Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh. Christ ascended into heaven together with those of his saints who had been at that time resurrected. So what does this imply? In Mark 13, 26, and in other passages also, it is stated that Christ will come again in the clouds, more literally in clouds. Again, Zechariah 14, 5 and Jude 14 reveals that Christ will come with his saints. Amen. The book of Job says what? They see the Lord coming back from heaven with ten thousands of the saints. We all get to go horseback, right? Amen. 
And you say, oh, we want to see one of those flying horses. Well, these horses that come back from heaven, they got wings. Amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they ain't got no form in their head. Amen. Yeah, so we have to look forward to riding a horse. Yeah, Amen. People who are scared of horses here on the earth ain't going to be scared there. Amen? Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Con combining these two statements, we find Christ will come in clouds with his saints. We also know that the ascension of Christ into heaven and his return from heaven are closely parallel. We know that further that Christ ascended into heaven in the cloud, and there we are therefore com completing the parallel. We suggest Christ ascended into heaven together with those of the saints who had been at that time resurrected. Hallelujah. One further point of interest comes to the note to this connection. Hebrews 12 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lie aside every way and the sin that so easily besnares us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Hallelujah. There's a race, amen. Hallelujah. The cloud of witnesses, amen. Amen. I picture there are like grandstands in heaven, and they're looking down on the earth, and they're watching your life. They're watching my life. Amen. And they're cheering us on. Come on, Brother Yard. Yes. The guys just bought. Pastor Josie, come on, bring it, girl. Yes. Amen. Brother Ruby, hallelujah. Pastor Jerome, let's go. Amen. Amen. They're cheering for us. Now, there are some uh, uh, negative people out there. So, good, good. So, they don't think about it. So, I don't even see what they got to say. You go back and say, sit in the rocket chair. All right. So, he says. The text makes it plain that he is referring to the Old Testament saints who exploits of faith are recorded in the previous chapter, chapter 11 of Hebrews. Is what? The faith chapter? And what's it say? Those great cloud of witnesses in heaven are watching us. That's the saints from the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. These Old Testament saints are pictured as a cloud of witnesses surrounding each Christian believer who undertakes to run the race of faith in the dispensation. In this way, the figure of a cloud is once again linked to the to the main old to the saints of the Old Testament. From all these considerations, both logical and scriptural, to suggest that on the day of his ascension, Jesus was taken up into heaven in the cloud, which also contained the Old Testament saints who had been resurrected with him. In this way, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ would exact and completely fill all that is indicated in the typology of the Old Testament ordinances of the first fruits. This would be exactly parallel to the methods of his promised return from heaven to earth. However, this conclusion should be taken no more as a logical inference from the various indications of scripture. It should not be put forth dogmatically as established doctrine. There it is. All right. Christ is the first fruit from the dead. Bring your sheep and wave it before the Lord. Amen. Come rejoicing, knowing that, hey, you imagine that you took some grain to the temple, you gave it to the priest, he waved it before the Lord, and it was accepted. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You know, when you give yourself to the Lord Jesus, amen, it's accepted. God doesn't say, clean up your rack. No. God accepts you the way you are. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, Ruth, can you close us in prayer? Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you.